This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Before I jump into a little best of archives episode today with two mathematicians, one of which who happens to have a Nobel Prize in economics, I first have a favor, a request. If you like this show, go to iTunes or whatever Apple application you're using and write a review. I want to hear what you have to say. And if you do, I will send you a really cool new video that I've produced that I think you'll enjoy. It's a little long form, but it really takes you through the whole process and thinking and philosophy of trend following. So again, if you like this podcast, go jump on iTunes and give me a review. That kind of sounds like an order. I'm not really ordering you. I would just like to see it. It keeps me motivated. Now today, as I said, two mathematicians. First, Robert Allman, the Nobel Prize winner in economics. Number two, Emmanuel Derman. Both of these guys very smart. Both of these guys are going to give you insights. Now, I got to say, I've posted Robert Allman as a repeat guest many times. He's 90 years old now, so this episode is a few years old. But there's something about this episode, especially for new listeners. It's just... Interesting. Interesting to hear how a man who was right there, right there with the game theory and the atomic age, thinks. Awesome stuff. I was so lucky to get him on this show. So without any further delay, let's jump right into Robert Allman and Emmanuel Derman. And by the way, Emmanuel has a great book out there. He might even have a second book now. I'm not sure. Check his books out on Amazon. And one last thing before we jump in, go write that review on iTunes. Now, with all of my rambling out of the way, let's jump right into two very smart mathematicians. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome the fourth individual to appear on my podcast who has won a Nobel Memorial Prize in economics. Today, Robert Allman joins me to discuss his work on conflict and cooperation through game theory analysis. He's just got a really interesting way of looking at the world. And we're talking about going back in time here. So Robert brings a fantastic perspective He first heard about game theory from John Nash. John Nash of the movie fame, A Beautiful Mind. I'm very lucky, very fortunate to have some of the brightest people alive today appear on my podcast. I hope you enjoy. Got my first degree at City College of New York. And I did a doctorate at MIT. Hmm. After that, yes, it's true. After that, I did a postdoctorate at Princeton, two right. years. Yeah, And that's, that's where I was going. What I was going at was in, at Princeton. That was where you yes. had a chance to either meet or hear John Nash. And that was your first exposure to game theory. No, that's also not quite correct. Uh, my first, ex- I met John Nash not at Princeton, but at MIT, where I did my doctorate. Nash had left Princeton at that time already. Nash had left Princeton. He did his doctorate, and he came to MIT in 54, if I'm not mistaken. No, in 53, in fact. He came to MIT in 53 after completing his doctorate at Princeton, and I was at MIT between 50 and 54, In 54, I went to Princeton, but Nash was no longer there. However, I did meet Nash 
and interact with him in uh, while in the academic year 53 54 uh, when we were both at MIT Okay. Well, I was just trying to lay some some background, and excuse me if I got a few dates off, but I, I just wanted to kind of for the audience to let them know a little bit of your background before we get into just to let you look. I, I've got a fairly sophisticated audience, but when it comes to game theory, and you know this all too well, there is a certain amount of effort that you've put into your career to to go down this path. And, and what I'd like for you to do from the very beginning is perhaps to talk about what game theory is trying to accomplish. And also, as you're explaining that, talk about the idea of rationality. I think the way you talk about rationality, sometimes these days people say, oh, it's, it's irrational, it's rational. And I think what's really interesting when I read your work is how you say, hey, hold on, rational is not necessarily ethical or moral. So perhaps you could touch on some of these basic uh, issues before we jump in. Let's uh, let's address that question first, and afterwards we'll get back to the question of uh, what is game theory trying to accomplish. Okay. So uh, actually, I have I have a a uh, an article with exactly that title: What is game theory trying to accomplish? Uh, but uh, first, let let me uh, face this issue of rationality. Uh, rationality. Um, from the point of view of economics, the economic definition of rationality, and this applies to all interactive situations, uh, not only economic ones, but also political, uh, international, uh, business. Uh, rational, rational means a, a person is rational if he promotes his own goals to the extent to the best extent of his knowledge. And as far as he knows, he is promoting his own goals. Okay? Given his knowledge, he is promoting his own goals. That's rational. It's not uh, logical thinking. It's not, it's not science. It's not uh, any, any of that stuff. It's not the, the daily use of the word. It's something else. And a student of mine um, put this uh, very nicely. He gave an example of a a, a person who's walking along the street and a black cat um, crosses his path, and he spits. Um, so according to the uh, usual definition of rationality, he's superstitious, and uh, he's acting irrationally by spitting. Yes, why, why spit when, when a black cat crosses your path? It's a superstition. So that's irrational. But according to the economic definition of rationality, he is, in fact, irrational if he does not spit. Yes, uh, because by spitting, he is, according to the best of his belief and knowledge, he is promoting his goals, which means because otherwise uh, he believes that something bad will happen to him if he does not spit. So if he does not spit, he's acting irrationally. So th this is a, uh, the, the difference between the definition of rationality as it is in economics and in game theory and in everyday parlance. Uh, let's get back to your first question. Uh, what is game theory trying to accomplish? Uh, game theory uh, is an analysis of um, interactive situations in which people are striving to entities, not necessarily people. Different entities interact with each other. What each one does affects what the other one gets, and each one is trying to promote his own goals. So each one is rational. He's trying to promote his own goals, and he is taking into account that the other players are also trying to promote their goals, not his goals, but their goals. Going back in time, I think it's really interesting in, in looking at your work, discussions of Cold War diplomacy, current international relations, and I was thinking the idea of a strategy matrix, because you, you know, people make the point before we would always know what we can do. But now the idea is to think what we can both do and put the, put the shoes on at the same time. 
The idea is that in, in analyzing an interactive situation, a game, it's important to analyze it from a from above, not not from your point of view. What should I do? Yes, but uh, simultaneously, given the possibilities, given uh, that that are open to uh, all the participants, all the players in this game, what uh, what possibilities are open to them, and what should each one do, given the possibilities that he has and that the other one has. He must take into account that the each player each player must take into account that the other player is also maximizing, is also trying to do the best that he can for himself. That that's the idea of the strategy matrix and, and like my uh, colleague Tom Schelling said, this just this way of looking at things rather than what should I do saying what should what should we both do? What is good for him? What is good for me? What is good for him, given what is good for me, and so on? Looking at it symmetrically, not only two players, also more players, this is one of the central important ideas of game theory. And your career is about bringing mathematical tools to that end. Yeah, my mathematical tools for thinking about these things, yes. Oh, oh, conceptual tools. I don't like the word mathematics, yes. I mean, it's a beautiful word, and, and I'm a mathematician. I'm proud of it. Uh, uh, but mathematics is not the point. The point is the point is thinking about this uh, coherently. Okay, thinking about it coherently uh, and and developing tools, conceptual tools, to formulate these ideas and and to to uh, and then and then eventually to analyze them, okay? Physicists, uh, all, all kinds of scientists use mathematics, and, and we use mathematics also, but mathematics is a tool. It's not a, uh, an end in itself. Professor, let me, can I jump into a few kind of examples that I think my audience can relate to? And geopolitics gives some, some great ways where we can go in a discussion of game theory. And I think there's, a, there's current situations in the world today that are fairly hot. And for example, uh, and we were talking about uh, rationality. And when I look at the media coverage of something like Ukraine and Vladimir Putin, people might say, well, here's irrational. And my thought, well, hold on, he's being perfectly rational for his situation. And sure. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's probably sure, and, and I, I think Iran also. I think a a, a uh, even more apt example. People often say that Ahmadinejad is uh, irrational, he's crazy, and so on. He's not crazy. He doesn't do what we want, but uh, but he's not crazy. He's highly rational, and and I think one should uh, one has to take this into account absolutely. And uh, as you say, Putin also. By the way, I have my doubts about American policy in the Ukraine. I think um, if one wants to uh, maintain a world peace, uh, I think Putin's reaction to Ukraine is, is in a way, um, maybe not only rational, but also uh, uh, understandable, okay? Uh, let's put it that way. Um, we would not be very happy if... Uh, if in Mexico, uh, somebody uh, suddenly, Putin suddenly made a, uh, a Russian revolution in Mexico uh, or in Canada. Yes, it's not. Uh, I think uh, there are accepted spheres of influence. The, the Ukrainian uh, revolution is, is rocking the boat. As we talk about conflict geopolitics, I saw you make some comments, and it, it's very logical and very it makes perfect sense. I think people don't want to accept this, and I'm paraphrasing a little, so forgive me. But if you want peace, prepare for war. If somebody sends a shell over at you, send a shell back. If you're ready, if you're ready for war, there's no fight. If you cry peace, you end up fighting. But you you look at that not only just in opinion terms. You get in the, the game theory is getting at those types of ideas, like as you say, with the conceptual framework. 
you know the Rome. You know when when you look at at uh, the search for peace, uh, President Obama uh, got the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, '09. Obama is a smart kid. He made a speech in Oslo on the 10th of December, 09, uh, acceptance speech of the uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize, in which he said the belief that peace is desirable is rarely enough to achieve it. And this was an understatement, and he understands the uh, he understands very well the um, the mechanics of these things, and and. What he was saying is that just saying, yelling, peace, peace, does not, not only does not necessarily bring about peace, it may bring about war. We, we, we all want peace, yes? I mean, nobody wants peace more than we here in Israel do, yeah. But uh, also Americans and Europeans and everybody wants peace, yeah. The question is exactly what what uh, um, Obama said. The belief that peace is desirable is rarely enough to achieve it. Wanting peace doesn't doesn't get you peace. Okay. What gets you peace? Well, who are the world champions in peace? The world champions. Who are, when I want to play good soccer, I go and I go to Germany and I, they are the world champions in soccer and I see how they play, okay? If I want to play good baseball, I see who won the last World Series and I look at their strategies. If I want peace, I go and I look at the world champions of peace in all of history. You tell me, who are the world champions of peace in all of history? Where is there Where is there any enduring peace? That doesn't happen, does it? There is no enduring peace. Where is there enduring peace, really? Well, there, there are places where there is enduring peace, yeah. For example, Switzerland. Okay? Right? Little yeah. country? Yeah. They've been at peace for several hundred years. <laughs> That's quite something. They have a great location, they know how to ski, and they have guns. Ah. Skiing, I think, is not that important, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although it plays a role, yeah. And the location is also, lots of places have good locations, yeah. And, and they're not at peace. They have guns. They have guns. They have jet planes. They have holes in the mountain. I often vacation in Switzerland. You vacation in Switzerland, whether it's in the winter or in the summer, you have the jet planes screaming overhead. What the hell do they need jet planes screaming overhead for? Why do they need fighter planes? Yeah, nobody's bothering them, right? Why do they need fighter planes? Why? 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 Uh, why uh, it's crazy. Spend all that money. That people spend a month uh, every couple of years in uh, uh, military duty and reserve service. The reason is that that's why nobody bothers them. Okay? And I'll give one more example. The biggest, after the, the Swiss really have had several hundred years of peace, but in a big way, the biggest champions of peace in world history are the Romans. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, lasted for 239 years. 239 years, the whole Western world was at peace. Never, no, you know, nothing. It's unbelievable, yeah. But that's what it was. And you know what their motto was? Their motto was, see this pakem parabellum, which means if you want peace, prepare for war. That's what it means. And that preparation for war is in, is in tanks, it 
It's in guns, like you said. It's in jet planes. It's it's in uh, in uh, drones and whatever you want. But not only there. It's in another place also. It's in your head, and you have to be willing to say, and you have to mean it. You have to mean it. You know what, fellas? We want peace. But if you want to fight, let's fight, okay? And if you can say that and mean it, then you don't have to fight. One of the things I wanted to jump into was the 2008-2009 bailouts, uh, the rescues. And, you know, obviously these types of things always invite the next crisis, from your perspective, uh, you know, your wisdom, and, and maybe looking at this from a game theory conceptual framework, how do you look at the bailouts, the the rescues that happened during that period of time? Well, the bailouts are not a good thing. It's just like you said, it's, it's, it, 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 it gives the uh, incentives to uh, companies to take risks uh, because it's... Uh, uh, if if uh, you take a risk and if it works out well, you put the money in your pocket, and if it works out poorly, you'll get bailed out. Uh, so uh, you won't make any money, but you won't lose any money. Uh, so it distorts the incentives. The incentives are to take more risks, and when they when bailouts are. On the other hand. Uh, when you have uh, big uh, big firms, uh, you know, it's control a lot of the economy. A, a failure of a firm like that can uh, really spell trouble. So, you know, I, I don't want to second guess Bernanke. You know, it could be it could be that at least some of these bailouts were. Uh, were not a good thing, but they they were uh, uh, something bad that that had to be done to to prevent uh, worse from happening. Uh, but I, I don't want to go all like that. But but in principle, you're quite right that they are to a bad thing. Yeah, you know? it's because they give the wrong uh, incentive. The the answer is not to have too much of the economy in the hands of a small number of firms. Yes, uh, uh, maybe that's easier said than done, but uh, that's that's what to that's the principle to uh, strive to, uh, so that uh, so you don't have to make bailouts. The company fails, uh, it fails. Uh, that's it, and and that will create the incentives to to be careful. Okay. Not to take undue risks, which uh, I, I think you, you got to do that through incentives and not through uh, not through regulation. Okay, uh, you, you can't go and say to a bank well, you can, but you shouldn't go and say to a bank, hey, you can't lend more, and or you can't have a leverage rate over such and such. Uh, you shouldn't do that. The the, the bank. Uh, should set its own uh, leverage rates. So it, it's important to have um, transparency. In other words, it has to say, "Hey, this is what I, this is my leverage rate, and this is how much I'm lending, and this is to whom I'm lending." And so, it's very important to have transparency. But beyond that, uh, I don't think these things should be regulated for. But uh, you know, like I say, sometimes. Um, Sometimes you got to do things which are not optimal either. The, the, the main thing is to, to maintain competition. This is very, very... The, the regulation is, should be... Regulation should be limited to maintaining competition, which means not, not having too many... too few large firms controlling the economy. And, uh, of course, the honesty, transparency, that, that's what regulation should be limited to. I know you said you don't want to second-guess Bernanke. I won't ask you to do that, but I'm imagining there's a side of you 
that deep in your stomach just doesn't like what happened in terms of the bailouts and the rescues. And I'm curious if there's a side of you that would have been curious to see what would have happened. Would it, would it have truly been a meltdown or? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. How can you tell? How can you tell? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, like I said, you're quite right. You have know, something deep down inside me that doesn't like the bailouts. You know, you're quite right. And I set that forth in my previous statement. But uh, but uh, I can understand that, uh, you know, somebody who's really running the show like the Nike was, you know, you've got to be a little careful, yeah, uh, not to, uh, you got to be a little careful, not, not, yeah. to, not to rock the boat too much. Yeah. Behavioral economics, you know, quite a, quite a few advances, if one could say, in, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, some Nobel Prizes handed out. But I've seen you make the comment about uh, artificial lab setups and not liking that. I wonder if you might expand some on your perception of behavioral economics, how you see it, uh, limitations, uh, pros, cons. First of all, there hasn't been a number of Nobel Prizes. There's been one, okay? One, uh, Danny Kahneman, okay? There hasn't been a number. Uh, well, one is a number, of course. But let's uh, let's uh, set that. Uh, I guess you could, you could say Vernon Smith, though. And that Nobel Prize is, is very interesting because it's not really a Nobel Prize. Like my Nobel Prize, it's not a full Nobel Prize. It's half a Nobel Prize, right? I shared my Nobel Prize with Tom Schelling, uh, so I got half. Okay, and Danny Kahneman also got half of the Nobel Prize. Now let's look at the other half. Okay. What's the other half of that Nobel Prize in 02? Uh, the other half is Von Smith. Okay, now, what did Danny Kahneman show? Danny Kahneman showed, uh, together with Amos Tversky, that uh, people uh, really uh, behave irrationally. They don't, uh, they don't behave uh, uh, in accordance with the... Um, dictates of economic theory. They behave, they have certain rules of uh, behavior uh, that uh, that govern their uh, uh, um, this, uh, anchoring endowment effect, uh, uh, representative heuristic, all kinds of things like that. Yes. Uh, now, um, a, that's what he showed. People do not behave in accordance with the economic theory. And he did it with uh, polls, with uh, questionnaires, with uh, lab experiments, that kind of thing. Um, what, what about the other half? What about Ben Smith? Uh, um, well, got a little less press, yes. Uh, what about his uh, part of the Nobel Prize? Well, it's very interesting because <laughs> he showed the opposite, yeah. He showed that economic theory does work, yeah. He did lab experiments uh, on people, and it turned out that economic theory works just fine, yeah. And he himself was surprised, yeah. You read his uh, Nobel uh, speech, uh, you find that uh, he himself was surprised to find how well economic theory works in the laboratory. One one guy shows that economic theory does not work, and the other guy shows that economic theory does work, and they share a Nobel Prize. I mean, you know, you could understand the Nobel Committee saying uh, we believe one and we don't believe the other, but you can't say we believe them both and we're going to give them both the Nobel Prize. That doesn't seem to make sense. So what's the answer? What What, what, what is going on over there? And the answer is that the Nobel Prize was not given for the conclusions. It was given for the methodology, which was new in economics. Well, not actually entirely new, because experiments were carried on in, in game theory and in economics for many decades. But these two guys, Bern Smith and Danny Kahneman, who's a good friend of mine, uh, they really uh, brought it to uh, to full flower, one might say. Or at least, yeah, let's see. There were other people also, yeah, like 
uh, uh, and, but uh, those two were chosen by the Nobel Committee to represent those two sides. The, the prize was given for the introduction and use of this methodology, okay, which was an important uh, methodology in economics, and it was, it was just, uh, the committee wanted to emphasize this. But still the question remains, how can how can they have shown opposite things? Yes, how can they have made convincing cases for uh, two things that uh, contradict each other? And the answer is that they don't contradict each other. They are both basically right. Both Kahneman and Von Smith are right. Now, how can that be? And here now I'm going to tell you how it can be. Kahneman took the um, exceptional case, okay? He said, he showed that in exceptional cases, people behave irrationally. Or let me put that more precisely. He said that people developed rules of thumb. Tversky and Kahneman call these rules of thumb heuristics. They develop heuristics. People do not make uh, explicit calculations. They do not optimize. Rather, they develop heuristics for how to act in the real world. And these heuristics usually work fine. They usually give optimal results. They usually give results that are rational. Not that the process is rational, but the results are rational. And each heuristics are chosen because the results are rational, usually. And they say this themselves in their original 1974 article in the magazine Science. They said these heuristics usually work fine. But occasionally, they misfire when they are misapplied, when they are applied to unusual situations, which the uh, the practitioner, the man in the field, the subject of the experiment is not used to, then they may give, and often do give, systematically irrational results. And then Smith, what he showed was that when you take the usual case, the situation to which the heuristic is meant to apply. And when you do that, then economic theory works fine. So their results do not contradict each other at all. Yeah. First of all, they didn't get the prize for the results. They got the prize for the methodology. And second of all, their results do not contradict each other. And I, I, I'm fully... Uh, um, I fully in, go along with that stuff. Yes, I go along with Smith and with Kahneman because I say that, right, people do not consciously optimize. They develop heuristics for, for dealing with all kinds of situations, yeah? And these heuristics usually work well, yeah? I call it rule rationality. They develop rules of behavior and the rules are, uh, as a rule, they are rational. So that's, uh, that's my response to that question. Listen, I have one more question for you, if you can. And I want to kind of go back in time a little bit. And I've seen in going and preparing to talk to you, we talked a little bit about it yesterday, which is the idea of, you know, professional diplomats, they don't really think in terms of payoffs and outcomes. But I would like for you, if and, and maybe even to use a historical example, something like the Cuban Missile Crisis and how that crisis, how game theory entered that crisis, how the, the conceptual frameworks that have become part of your life entered that crisis. And if you could comment on something, look, it's a big subject. We could talk for a long time. I could pick your brain all day about that subject. But I wonder if you might be able to give a big overview in a short bit of time. Well, you know, uh, Tom Schelling, um, in his Nobel acceptance speech, uh, he, that, that speech was called uh, The Amazing 60 Years. And uh, this was in the uh, winter of 05, 
oh, sorry, in, in, uh, in December of 05, late fall of 05. And so the uh, 60 years was uh, started in 1945. And what was amazing about that period from 45 to 05 is something that did not happen. And what did not happen was uh, that uh, an atomic weapon was not exploded in anger for 60 years. For 60 years, there have been atomic weapons in the international arena, and not once was an atomic weapon exploded in anger. So that was the title of his Nobel acceptance speech. And Tom himself had a lot to do with that, by the way, because he was a game theorist and he was an influential figure in Washington during much of that period. What was going on really in the Cold War? What 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 made it happen that the, those sixty years, those amazing sixty years, were really were, really did happen? Yes, and or did not happen? Yes, that 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 the, that event uh, that he was talking about did not happen. Well, what brought that about? Well, a lot of people during that period uh, were for nuclear disarmament. Okay, and there was a lot of talk about a lot of agitation for uh, nuclear disarmament uh, during that entire period. I remember being uh, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and seeing a bumper sticker on a car uh, that said, uh, one nuclear explosion could ruin your whole day. Uh, now, of course, that was meant to be amusing, and it was amusing. It's a nice uh, quip. But it, but it was symptomatic of the agitation that was during that entire period for uh, nuclear disarmament. Now, the truth is that what kept the world from uh, entering into the abyss of the uh, of turning the Cold War into a hot war, what kept the world from that was the presence of nuclear weapons. Uh, it is it is paradoxical. It's paradoxical that the presence of nuclear weapons can not to disarm the armament, yeah, can prevent a Holocaust. And how does that happen? What was it that prevented World War III? What prevented World War III is that, is that the, you know, um, I would say uh, over 40 years or just well over 40, somewhat over 40 years, from about late 40s to late 80s, 40 years, there were no bombers carrying nuclear weapons in the air. In the air, okay, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for 40 years. Hmm. Uh, 365 days a year, including Christmas. Hmm. Okay, so so uh, all the time there were um, nuclear bombers in the air. And that's what prevented the war, okay? That sounds funny to have bombers in the air, and that's what prevents the war. But that is what happened, and that's game theory. Okay, that is game theory, and and uh, I think uh, that played a role in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, also probably. And uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was a very, very serious affair. I thought the world was coming to an end, or, you know, might very well come to an end. Not, not in, in a year. In, in two or three weeks, yeah. uh, it was very, very serious. Kennedy, um, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I would have had the guts to, to play it the way he played it, but uh, uh, he did. And cooler heads, namely Khrushchev, uh, prevailed and uh, it came out okay. Well, uh, came out okay. I think another interesting insight from that period was the uh, 
shelter uh, construction, the fallout shelter construction uh, craze uh, in uh, 1960, 61. I was before the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a craze of building fallout shelters in the United States. People would build these shelters and they would, e they would equip them uh, with food and drink and so on. And also uh, machine guns to keep, not to keep the Russians out, but to keep the neighbors out. And, and this, uh, you know, this continued for a period, I don't know, several months or a year or two. Then it died down. Now this uh, fallout uh, building, for a, for a shelter building, cra shelter building craze, created a a, a very serious uh, detente between the United States and Russia. Uh, the the Russians considered this an aggressive act. Now how can a building a fallout shelter be considered aggressive? But you see, uh, it, for this you need game theory. When you build a fallout shelter, you are reducing your um, your vulnerability. That's the word I was looking for. You are reducing your vulnerability to attack on the other side. But the attack on the other side is just like I was explaining up to now, is that's what was keeping the peace. So this was considered an aggressive move. Okay. I Thank you, sir. Has been, um Helpful. Yeah, it's great. I appreciate you taking the time today. It's a privilege. And, you know, I think you you probably have lived your life like this, giving back to other people and teaching. I feel privileged to have had a little bit of time with you to uh, to learn in the last couple of days. So I thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you. Be well. Be well. Thank you. My guest today is Emmanuel Derman. He is a South African-born academic businessman and writer, best known as a quantitative analyst. His books include My Life as a Quant, Reflections on Physics and Finance, also Models Behaving Badly. Former Goldman Sachs, Columbia professor, he has a wide range of experiences. A fun conversation, an interesting guy. I hope you enjoy. Emmanuel, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Michael? I'm not too bad. Hey, you know, I, I'm not sure if he's an acquaintance of yours or not, but a professor at Columbia was on my show recently, Alex Gracerman. Uh, you know, I've never met him. I know who he is. Okay. I, it's a it's a small world and a big world all at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he teaches in, we have two sort of finance, math, finance, financial engineering programs. I think he teaches in the other one. I've often heard students met him, mention him, but I don't think I've ever met him. Well, listen, we can cover a lot of topics today, and I'll try and throw a lot of different things at you. And you have a lot of different views and opinions on things that are that are fun and interesting. And when I reached out to you, and I guess we can start with this, I reached out to you, and you were you were asked by a publication to give a comment on this book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, I believe it's called. And you didn't really offer a view on it. You, you took it as an opportunity to offer some feedback on economists. And I, and I want to give a quick quote just to give a flavor of your view and that was published. And I'm sure you're going to expand on it. But you, you talked about that the public arguments of economists often have an incestuous yet masturbatory quality that's exhausting to follow. The only field more self-confidently, but just as regularly wrong as economics is nutrition. Boy, that's just laying down the gauntlet, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Although I've actually once wrote something not quite as inflammatory, but in a blog when I used to blog on Wilmot.com years ago. But I think it's true. I mean, um, I was careful thinking about master masturbatory and incestuous, but I think it's right. <laughs> it's, it's incestuous because they're actually all very closely related to each other and yet having a passionate relationship with each other, which is sort of a characteristic of incest. And um, it's masturbatory in that it never gets resolved. It's sort of uh, fruitless. You know, you read Paul Krugman or you read John Cochrane, they're always battling. They write the same things over and over again and never convince each other. Before we even get into the subject of the book, which I know you stated in the article that you had not read, 
your point your point really was you didn't even want to get into the debate because you felt like the people that are that are the debaters, the people that are pushing forth the argument and their their research, their homework behind it is not even worth the time because it's so wildly different across so many different views. Yeah, I'm not sure that's true of Piketty. I mean, I know Piketty, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. People say Piketty. I haven't read his book. I've read reviews of it. I said, I don't really want to spend six hundred. So the trouble with a lot of books is you can condense them in one line in a way. <laughs> I don't want to read it. I wouldn't be at all surprised if inequality has increased. I don't really have anything against his book. I've just got a a bad feeling. I mean, economics dominates the daily newspapers and the talk shows and the op-eds so violently that um, I've heard other people say, too, I just don't feel like reading another book. I, I actually, I don't think Piketty himself irritates me. It's just the class of, of endless argument. And it's like nutrition in the sense that um, they're very scathing about each other. I know I'm simplifying. They're very scathing about each other, but um, they're never able to convince each other. You know, I saw you make a comment in an interview. You, you said something to the effect of engineering, chemistry can be value free. It, it, it is what it is. Economics, I saw you define as we might as well be calling it a moral science. Why don't you explain your thought process there? Yeah, I like that. I think, um, you know, economics, I, I've never studied economics in my life. I'm a novice. I, I sort of, I, I went to school in South Africa, which is like a British system where you major in whatever you get to major right away, undergraduate. So I, you know, I did sciences from the age of 16 and a half. Um, I learned finance um, on the job when I came to Goldman Sachs in 1985. Somebody gave me the Black Scholes, um, actually the Cox Ross Rubenstein and Black Scholes model to read. And then threw me in feet first. So I come late to economics. But in my youth, people who studied economics, you know, they did PPE, which is politics, philosophy, and economics. And if you look at Black Scholes, I think it's originally published in the Journal of Political Economy or something like that. And economics wasn't always, um, wasn't always so mathematical. It was, uh, I, I don't have my, my uh, Guardian article about Piketty in front of me, but I said something like, Economics is about how to spend limited resources to achieve um, what people think is worthwhile achieving, and and that's a that's a kind of moral decision. It's not a mathematical decision. The mathematics is a technique, but it takes some bigger view of the world and some agreement to decide, or maybe disagreement in the end, about what's actually worth doing. Am I answering your question? I'm not sure. Well, and I think what you're really getting at too is that economics is just it's being positioned as something that it's not. There's always going to be a human or a moral element, as you say. It's not just a formula that you let run. If it was, there wouldn't be such a massive disagreement out there. Right, right. I, yeah, yeah. I, I can't put it better than that. But but that's sort of uh, actually not from Piketty and not from um, Darren Asimoglu, whom I actually met. I gave a talk somewhere in Germany about a month ago, and he gave a talk on um, what makes nations fail. And that's sort of as best as I could understand in the more classical economic framework. Although he told me that he actually started out as a very mathematical economist and you sort of had to do that. When you decided to give the opinion on the Piketty work, did you, were you in the back of your mind also sharing or having a belief on his basic premise? I, I don't question his basic premise, um, but just, just intuitively, I think it's probably likely it's, it's likely to be true. I was really, uh, in some sense, I was just ranting against the state of economic discourse mm. and, you, mm. and using him as a, as a crutch. You know, I, I actually have, I haven't read his book, as I said in that article, and I suspect what he says is right, but he became, you know, I don't know, every, every few months or every few years, there's this, there's this craze about some book and he was the current one. I think I tweeted one day, I can't remember what was before that. At one point it was Michael Lewis's book, um, mm which I actually did read. Forget what it's called now. Do you know which one I mean? The last one. Yeah. I, I get a kick how you, how you think about this stuff. I sometimes feel the same way is that there's so much information, you take it in and sometimes books, and I even look at some of my books like this, sometimes it's really one great idea is all it is, you know? Yes. If you don't want to read, a lot of books can be summarized in, in, a, short, in a short space. Let me, take, let me take you back a few years. I think you have some opinions on this subject as well. 
And I still talk to people about it. It's still, it's still, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but it still bothers me to this day that all four of the U.S. investment banks were not allowed to go by the wayside. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm horrified at what happened. I argue a lot with friends what happened in the bailout in the sense that if, if capitalism is going to make sense for anybody, you know, it's a brutal business, but the idea is you pay your money or you, you make your bets and you take the results. And, and that didn't happen. You know, we, we bailed out. Um, who are you talking about specifically? Well, I mean, we, 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 we went down the line. Bear, Bear disappeared and Lehman Brothers disappeared. And then we got to, the, we got to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and they, they signed and said they'd line in the sand. Yeah, they were about to disappear. I actually went to a sort of Goldman, ex-Goldman people's party shortly after that. And and people were saying that they were really scared that weekend. You know, they, they were planning, you know, they were expecting the end, you know. And I think the, I don't know who it was, the Fed or the Treasury went in and made them a bank holding company and literally saved their bacon. But people say, and I think it's right that, they didn't own junk the way maybe um, a Merrill or, or Bank, uh, eventually Bank of America did. But still, even if you go down for systemic reasons, as opposed to your bad decisions, that's still one of the risks that you knew about and took. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you deserve to be saved, and not at public expense. Yeah, I think that's a pretty straightforward opinion. Uh, I happen to share it. I think a lot of other wise people share it as well, too. Let me get you to go back in time, though. So ultimately... You get your PhD in theoretical physics. You had that before you started at Goldman. Oh yeah, I, I have a I have a roundabout route. I got a PhD in 1973, and actually, unlike a lot of the physicists on Wall Street, I actually worked for seven years afterwards as a physicist doing research. So from 73 to 80, I, I was a postdoc in various places in University of Pennsylvania, and then in Oxford, and then at Rockefeller University in New York. And then I was an assistant professor. Am I getting too too long winded? No, no, not at all. Okay, then I was assistant professor at University of Colorado at Boulder, which was a very nice place. But my wife was in academic life too in biology, and we were always moving in different places. And we had a small kid already. My son was born in England, and um, I sort of threw the towel in. I got kind of tired of the whole thing. It was getting too hard to find a job where you wanted, and I was getting a bit disillusioned in general. So I went to work at Bell Labs, which was what Wall Street is now for, or was for physicists in 1980, Bell Labs, and actually the energy industry, um, Exxon um, Labs, were, were the places where technical people went when they couldn't get university jobs anymore. So I went there for five years, and then I came to Goldman in 1985. So now you would have been at the front line of uh, physicists being hired onto Wall Street. I mean, you were right there at the at the at the beginning stages of that. You know, close to the beginning, but not absolutely. I went to I, I interviewed in '83 when I was at Bell Labs. I interviewed. I came away at Goldman, and I didn't take a job. And then two years later, I kind of had enough, and I did. But there were people there already. I would say from the very late '70s or early '80s in a small amount. By the time, having been at Bell Labs and then going to Goldman, you were well aware of what Goldman was. You, you, was no more, you were not kind of just new to the idea of Wall Street and whatnot. You were, you were like, okay, I know how my experience can benefit myself going to this investment bank. You knew as you were taking that position. It wasn't, I've talked to some folks that actually have gone in with your type of background and, and they really were like, well, just tell me that I didn't know anything. You know, I, I wasn't as, as knowledgeable as you say. I, I was in a, I was at Bell Labs, for, I was for five years in what they called the Business Analysis System Center, or Business Systems Analysis Center. I can't quite remember. It was sort of a, yeah, there was a lot of ex-scientists already doing other stuff, mostly computerish. But I didn't know that much about Wall Street. I learned a little bit of finance. They sent me once to an MIT sort of exec ed course for two weeks where I learned a little bit about the capital asset pricing model, but didn't really understand it. I, I went to Wall Street more because I'd, I'd had it with Bell Labs. Mm. And, and I was sitting there the whole time for several years thinking, should I try to go back to physics academic life, which was really hard because I wanted to stay in New York. And I would have had a, I wasn't even sure if I could get a job and I would sort of had to go back a bunch of career steps or 
jump all the way out of the ivory tower, which Bell Labs was partially, and and go to and go to go to Wall Street. And you were getting lots of calls from Wall Street headhunters in those days. They were fishing, dropping their bait in Bell Labs, and eventually I gave in. Um, not sure what I was in for, really. <laughs> well, that, that's that's kind of where I was going to go. So you you have an idea of what Goldman Sachs is, and perhaps how your skills might be used, and then you get there. What was what were some of the feelings, experiences that you can talk about early on that that perhaps were the real eye opener about what you were in the middle of? Yeah, you know, it was actually I almost feel a little bad saying it, but it was actually quite wonderful because. I felt like a real trader leaving physics in 1980 and leaving things that I liked. And and Bell Labs, I didn't really, I was kind of unhappy for five years, almost from the moment I got there. Maybe I'd been unhappy anywhere I would have gone after being in physics, but, but Bell Labs was the place, and it was very bureaucratic. It was part of AT&T. They had a million people. There were literally a, a staff of a million people. There was an incredible bureaucracy in which, you know, every four Members of technical staff worked for a, a supervisor. Every four supervisors worked for a department head. Every four department heads worked for whatever it was. And everybody was asking permission all the time for everything. And coming from physics, I was used to sort of thinking, I'm going to live or die by my own skill, you know, and not be part of a big bureaucracy. And so when I came to Goldman, this is in 1985, there were maybe five or six or 7,000 people there. It was large already, but nothing like now. It was actually very entrepreneurial in a good way. I was doing research. I wasn't really a market person. I wasn't a trader. I wasn't a salesman. They had a very intellectual environment, at least for people like me. And and in addition, unlike at Bell Labs, maybe this sounds um, counterintuitive, but at Bell Labs, I always had the feeling that um, everybody wanted to be a supervisor and they were going to climb over your back to become one. And what people really respected, except except for a few except for a few isolated counterexamples what people respected was the ability to be a manager and when i came to goldman if you're a geek if you're a programmer if you could solve differential equations you might be sort of a little weird but you got paid not badly and people kind of respected you so it was actually i, I got very excited coming there i got a real shot in the arm i write in my book that i used to go up and down on the subway to work reading reading Cox and Rubenstein on options markets and feeling like I had something to learn and something to contribute. Let's, let's break apart, you know, one of your, your great lines, you know, my life as a quant, the title of your book too. Why don't you break apart model building and, and, and your model building at Goldman Sachs, the good and bad of it. Pick a way to kind of let the audience, look, some of my audience is inexperienced. Some of them are very experienced to perhaps your peers, but why don't you just describe the idea of model building and how you were indoctrinated to model building and the types of models that you were building? That is a big question. I'm trying to think how to work my way into it. But um, yeah, I came there and, as I said, the first thing somebody did was throw um, throw Cox, Cox, uh, Cox Ross Rubenstein model, binomial model at me, asked me to read it and then start fixing a program that didn't work, that had some errors in it. Well, first of all, uh, I'm trying to think. First of all, I worked very closely with traders. The research group I was in worked very closely with traders who actually used these models. So I liked it because it was a bit like being a theoretical physicist where you work closely with experimentalists, which is what I had done in my previous life, the traders being the, the experimentalists. You could apply it right there. Yeah, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was very nice because you, you know, God knows, God knows, if it's ethically justifiable, I ran into people who cursed me at the time when I said I was working on Wall Street. But you actually worked on a model, and it was iterative, and, and um, there was lots of interaction. You started doing something. A trader would try it. They would give you some feedback. They, they knew what the, what the actual financial problem was better than you did. So that, that part was very exciting. It was like a collaboration between people using it and people trying to, trying to understand how to make something that would work for them. They understood the markets, you understood the math better, and maybe the modeling. One of the things that became very clear to me at the time and, and was that user interface was very important. I had a background from Bell Labs in building user interfaces and building not just Fortran programs, but real Unix sort of trading systems. And 
one of the things that became very clear to me was that what mattered a lot for a model was not just the extra math or the extra finance or the extra computer science or statistics. It was an interdisciplinary mix of all of those, but that the ergonomics was very important. The first thing I did was replace a very old fashioned model that didn't have a screen at all. And you had to enter all the data line by line in a question and answer way. This was a long time ago in 1985. And I built from scratch. I knew how to do it. There were no spreadsheets in those days. I built a screen that moved the cursor around and asked the user enter the coupon, enter the maturity date, enter the option expiration, um, maturity date for the bond, and then saved all that information so that if he came back the next day, he could look at the same trade and try to analyze it again if they hadn't done it yet. And I suddenly realized how important, you know, how important the, the software environment is in addition to the model. Am I answering your question? Yeah, absolutely. I just you know, it's, sometimes it's just a you just want to get inside folks' minds, have them relay some experiences. I think that's what the audience enjoys. The audience enjoys just hearing people how they walked their path. So there's nothing you're going to say that's going to be boring. You've had an interesting career. You know that. Okay, I I like the mix of theory and software, and I think it was very important. And actually, when I ran groups later. I always not. I didn't like to separate the so-called information technology part from the from the quantitative financial part. I liked one person who could do both of those, and and that's the way I grew up uh, doing my own dirty work. That's the way I sort of lived for most of the time I was on Wall Street. And these things go in phases, actually. Then somewhere around the late nineties, that changed, and the IT people and the quant people became separate. You know, the the thinkers and the developers. But I think it's gone the other way again now with algorithmic trading and trading systems. There's been a unification of those skills in one person again. Hmm. And I, I think that's good. It, it, it makes for a much more interesting life as well. You know, I start this conversation off letting you compare economics to perhaps other sciences. One of the things that you've also done, though, too, is compare finance models to physics models. And look, I could think of people in my world ha having written some books about the, the style of trading called trend following, and many, many of these traders today, and I and I understand why they do it, and it makes perfect sense to me, are are, are coming at uh, in their in their public and private announcements from a from a scientific method standpoint. That's you know they're describing their methods in science terms. I can think of two traders, one running about a $25 billion fund and one running about a $5 billion fund combined. They got pretty good money. They're, they're unrelated, but I'm just, the reason I bring it up is that Goldman Sachs owns 10% of each of them. And so I'm curious, I'm curious if you would break apart, because I've got some other points here, but why don't you break apart big picture wise, the notion of the financial model and science and just the physics model and science. You know, I like to say that finance and, and physics have the same syntax, but not the same semantics, in that if you look at a finance paper and a physics paper, they actually, the finance paper looks much more formal than most physical physics papers these days. Everybody in economics writes, I can talk about that later, writes in the strange mathematical axiomatic style. But, but the semantics is different, even though they both use maths and you might naively confuse one for the other, it's very different. In physics, you actually have equations that accurately describe the world to a very high degree of accuracy and predict the future. And most financial models don't predict the future. That's not the way people in, in, in the trading world use them. They usually take a model and calibrate it to liquid current prices and then use it to estimate in the present the value of less liquid things. You know, they, they, people really predict the future. They, they rather try to figure out what illiquid things are worth given the price of liquid things. That's what Black Scholes really does for you. It tells you if you know the price of a short-term bond interest rates, in other words, and if you know the price of a stock, it'll tell you roughly what the price of an option should be. Um, so it's always going from the present to the present, not from the present to the future. So, so that's one big semantic difference. Secondly, uh, it just doesn't work as well. A lot of finance is really glorified interpolation. That's not an insult. It's just a fact. In, in the way that I described, you're trying to go from liquid prices to from liquid known fungible prices to illiquid values and estimate them. But that doesn't work badly as long as the world stays in the same sort of state as you're in when you calibrated the model. But 
but when when trouble comes, all bets are off. Your models don't really work. And, you know, I kind of like to say that all financial models, at least of the kind that I worked on, are really short volatility in the sense that when volatility increases, they're going to do badly. Well, that's, that's an interesting point because I was thinking about, for example, uh, Nassim Taleb and Mark Spitznagel and thinking about the trend following world, my, my world, it's a lot of long volatility. When you think about models, though, is it, is, it a, is it your experience, the short volatility models is where you really have the issue? Or do you also look at the long volatility models and say, you know, I've got some concerns there as well? No, I was actually talking, well, I think both. I was just saying in a way that whether you build long vol models or you know, Taliban, I'm stepping aside, Taliban Spitznagel, I think are less building models than just saying it would be smart to, to be long volatility, not short volatility, because when trouble comes, you'll make, you'll, you'll make money if you're on out of the money options. I think they're not really building building structural models in the sense that, say, Black Scholes is or something like that. But if you're, what I was trying to say is, if you're a long vol or if you if you're a trend follower, that's good as long as the world stays fairly calm. But hidden inside there in the market, there's something that's making you short vol because if you get a big increase in volatility, your model is probably going to be wrong. Am, am I making sense? Yeah. No. No. I just. I mean, I'm just thinking from a trend following perspective, changes in volatility. Look, nobody can predict the future. And I think it's it's how I'm just I'm I'm in I'm I'm very interested in your view of finance models compared to physics models. And I guess I was just curious the types of models that you were specifically thinking of when you started to go down this comparison between the two. I was thinking of CAPM, efficient markets, black shoals. Mm-hmm. Um, Almost any, almost any of the models that I face every day, although I mostly come from a derivatives world, not from a, at least when I worked on Wall Street, not from an asset management world. But the big issue for you ultimately, and if we just break this down to simple terms, how does one estimate risk? Yeah, I think I'm trying to, let me, let me go back to what I was saying before. Sure, sure. And, and then I'll come back to that. But in physics, for some, for some wonderful reason, okay. In this book I wrote called Models Behaving Badly, I tried hard to distinguish epistemologically somehow between the idea of a theory and a model. And I said theories are things that really try to describe the world the way it is. So, for example, in Newton's laws, you say force equals mass times acceleration, and there's nothing relative about that. You say that's the way the world is. You may be right, you may be wrong, but that's that's what Newton says. And so physics has two classes of, of attempts to understand the natural world. One is theories where they say something like force equals mass times acceleration, which is just a statement about the way somebody thinks the world works and it actually does. And then the other one are, so that's an absolute model, an absolute statement, and I call that a theory. And a model is more of an analogy where you say the nucleus is like a liquid drop of water. That's not an absolute statement. That's a relative statement. What you're saying is, for example, you can think of the nucleus as a, of an atom as a vibrating, rotating drop of water. And somebody actually got the Nobel Prize for that model because it works pretty well. But everybody in physics understands that saying the nucleus, it's called the liquid drop model of the nucleus. Everybody in physics understands that that's a model, but that Newton's laws are a theory. And what makes it a model is that it's making a comparison between something you understand and something you don't. I don't think finance has any theories. If you look at efficient market models or black shoals, finance models are saying stock prices behave like smoke diffusing or like Brownian motion, like dust particles bumping around, being bumped by atoms in a, in a room. And those are analogies and they're insightful, but they're, but they're not true. They're not true in the way that Newton's laws are true. So they break down at some point. And I don't think finance has any real absolute theories that are correct. So, for example, coming back to what you said about risk, at least the traditional sort of modern portfolio theory measures risk as the standard deviation of returns. And that would be the real risk if if stocks really did behave like particles of dust being bumped around under Brownian motion, but they don't. It's not a, it's not a bad model. It, it's not a bad analogy to give you a feel for what things are like, but it's actually not true. No, I think that's the big difference between 
physics and finance is that physics somehow has this ability because it's dealing with inanimate objects to write down something that works pretty well. And finance can really only make analogies that ultimately fail. You know, right now at this point of your career, you're in the academic community again. So, you know, those are pretty strong statements. Do you find you find a significant amount of pushback from others in the academic community when you say things so bluntly uh, as you just did? Mm. Or, do, or do they kind of go, oh, shit, don't say that because you know, we, we know it's true. But, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think I think people who work on Wall Street on trading desks agree with what I'm saying. And I've heard people say similar stuff. I worked for Bob Lutzenberger at one point, and he certainly felt similarly. I think everybody understands that on Wall Street, and good traders understand that. And I think people at Goldman understand that, which is why why they didn't lose a lot of money. They maybe should have gone down because the whole system was going to go down, but they didn't go down out of buying bad securities. But academics have a very, most of the academics I've met have a very um, bad mental model of the way people use models. And I think they don't understand what I was saying. They still, they tend to teach economics and finance in a very mathematical way with axioms and theorems and lemmas and don't really worry about about whether that's true or not. They, they don't understand how sloppily people use, sloppily but intelligently people use models in a trading environment. It struck me, not having your background, but looking at a lot of different white papers, and sometimes some of them I just kind of glaze over, but you've made the comment, the idea that you know finance papers often these days clearly look like science papers. And I saw you make the comment that it's almost a perversion of common sense. That's, you know, it's the idea of human behavior being put into these formulas that resemble physics formulas is kind of maybe fooling ourselves, isn't it? I think you have to, so I think if you want to work in this field intelligently, you have to be a little bit schizophrenic. You sort of have to you can't avoid using mathematics, but you have to keep looking over your shoulder all the time and saying, I know this isn't really right. And I know it's going to break down because I'm describing people and markets which are driven by people and they don't really work this way except for a small period of time or in a small, small range of environments which may change in any instance. So I think you have to sort of keep keep being suspicious about everything you do, which I think academics don't do. They, they, they have this... I'm, I'm talking blanket terms, but they have this idea that you can write down something and just keep going and that the world actually works that way. And if your model doesn't work, they somehow think somewhere out there, there is a Holy Grail model and we're getting closer and closer to it. But I don't think that's the case at all because the, the, the environment in which you use the models keeps changing and even using a new model changes the environment and you don't really get closer and closer to, to this. You know, in physics, maybe you get closer and closer to the grand theory of everything. Maybe you don't, but but at least you could plausibly argue that you do. But I think it's a mistake to think that way in, in, in finance. When you talk to your students and you're talking about quantitative models, you want them to be able to explain them qualitatively as well too, huh? Yes, I do. I think it's, very, and I think that's something, well, I learned that in physics, but I learned it at Goldman too, that if you want to communicate with people who use these models, but aren't as numerate as you are, it's very important to understand the model, the model from an intuitive point of view or from a, from a visceral point of view. You don't just want to do a calculation and say this is the answer. Um, you want to understand, you know, preferably in advance, what the answer might look like and what are the important parts that enter. And that's when you really learn a lot. And I think that's, to some extent, the benefit of getting a PhD, you know, which in itself doesn't mean that much, but I think... At least in physics, when you get a PhD, you have to go through a lot of hard struggle to not just derive equations, but understand what they mean in a, in a qualitative way. And anyway, I try to impress that on the students and they, they do it, but it, it's a hard job. I was going to say for some very bright teenage students, very bright math aptitudes, trying to explain to them why they need to spend their time also proving this qualitatively is, is probably sometimes they might look at you and go, why? There are, yeah, finance, yeah, you know, you can be a math genius at, at, at age 18 or, or you can be a chess genius at age 16 or 17 or 18. I think you can't be a physics genius that early and you can't be a finance genius that early. It takes, it takes a lot more 
understanding of the world than just doing saying playing chess. Mm. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. Listen, Emmanuel, I appreciate you coming on today. I just want to have a. I just want to have a quick chat. I just. I know you have some interesting perspectives. I've. I'm up to close to 300 podcast episodes, and like I said, I'm sure many of the folks I've had on have been your peers. But I thought you had some really. Very strong, clear views about economics, finance, and a science such as physics, and and kind of comparing and contrasting all three. And I think it's good food for thought for people just to stay grounded and keep their eyes wide open. As you say, keep looking behind you as well, too, and keep worrying and being a little skeptical that there could be a breakdown. Things might not go the way you expect, might not go the way that the formula dictates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I think physics, yeah, physics and finance are, are very different. I said before, they use the same language and they use some of the same skills, but but the meaning of what they do is very different. Yeah. But I, I'm a bit sad about the way economics has gotten so mathematical and even finance, you know, it, it's gotten much more mathematical than physics in a way. People in physics, I said this in my book, but you write down equations and they're tremendously, sometimes they're tremendously efficacious, even if you're not very formal, in the sense they really do explain things. And in finance, you can't get published these days unless you write very mathematical papers, and often they have no efficacy at all. I mean, that's that's just, I mean, that's got to be shocking for quite a few people to hear. I mean, you've got, you know, it's not like you're a new guy on the block, and you're just basically saying that you know, if I get back to your original descriptor that I pulled from that article, you basically just describe a good portion of the field that are writing these finance papers as publishing mental masturbation. And I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like what you're saying. It's all exaggerated a little bit. It doesn't apply really, but I think it's true. And then the counterexample to that is behavioral economics. And I once wrote a column for a German newspaper. I'm kind of disappointed in behavioral economics, too. I got very excited when I first started to learn about it, because it seemed like what Kahneman and Tversky were going to do and what did set out to do, although I learned it much later, was to explain people's anomalous, you know, mistaken, mistaken intuitions about risk in a mathematical way. So they don't like uh, losses. They're willing to do anything to cover their losses, um, even irrationally. And they try to describe all this in prospect theory. And it looked really the right way to go to try to sort of build the mathematics of the way people actually behave rather than the way efficient markets assume. But I think it's gotten kind of perverted when I look at behavioral finance now too. A lot of the articles are about gender issues in, in CEOs. Um, I, if, I, if I Googled for a minute, I would find my article that I wrote. But they just, if you look at the, the SSRN newsletter of behavioral economics, so many of the articles are about you know, whether where the stock markets do worse the day after uh, they lose a game in the World Cup. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. I'm, I'm not making these things up. Or CEOs, gender studies, or um, small market anomalies. They're sort of mildly interesting, but you get the feeling that they don't amount to a whole discipline in the way that classical economics did, or even efficient markets and that people are yeah, sort of just digging around for things to publish. You're yeah, doing something similar to what somebody else did before in a slightly different case so they can have an article. It's a great point. I almost, I sometimes look at behavioral economics and finance and I say, well, gosh, it's like, it's like grasping for straws to come up with an example for, for this particular week, month, or year. Whereas maybe the original guys, as you mentioned, uh, had some innovative and novel thought. But today it does seem like uh, people are, are are reaching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, classical, or whatever you call it, classical um, portfolio theory or efficient market, it's it's not strictly correct, but there's something comprehensive and attractive about it. And um, behavioral economics started out that way too, but I think it's gone astray. And, and it's gone astray in another way too, in that it's become a political tool in the sense that the people who are, who are using behavior, so-called behavioral economics a lot are really... Politicians? Yeah, behavior, Richard Thaler, I believe, was head of behavioral economists for Obama. You know, they're trying to... And, and for, so, so the people who are using it are advertisers and, and politicians or political manipulators, both in the business of manipulation, trying to portray politicians 
to you depending on what you clicked on last trying to show you that part of the politician that would appeal to you if you're that kind of person am i making sense you know so they look at your profile on the web and um if you're one kind of person they'll show you one side of the political person they want you to vote for candidate if you're on another if you've clicked on other things they'll show you something different and um yeah I, I don't think that's a great way to run a democracy. I was sort of used to growing up in South Africa where there were big issues and you look to politicians to lead you rather than to follow. You know, now they seem to want to figure out what is it you want and then I'll pretend to be that as opposed to people like Obama or um, or actually Gorbachev or Leclerc who, who, who got one step ahead of history by trying to figure out how to get to a non-violent solution rather than trying to figure out what people want and say, I'll give it to you. I'll pretend to give it to you. Yeah. But I think you, you probably, if you, I guess if we really were to get scientific for po about politicians, we could probably all argue regardless of political stripe, left, right, center, they all kind of work from the same playbook. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't criticizing one particular, just what you know, I wasn't particular one particular one. I was sort of more saying, there's a style of politics now, which is to sort of lead from behind rather than from in front. Mm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's it's all about polling. And what what is your particular view, as you mentioned, and just trying to deliver the flavor of the week and make somebody happy for that moment in time. But there's very little of that stand up. This is the right direction. This is the way we need to go. Look, I, a great example. I know you probably up in the New York area. I mean, would we ever build the Brooklyn Bridge today? Of course not. Oh my God, that's so yeah, that's so depressing. I live in in Manhattan, and I remember when the West Side Highway fell down. When I still worked at Bell Labs, and I had to drive that way every day in the eighties, and nobody's ever rebuilt it. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't can't. There's getting things done has become so protracted, and um, you know that's a whole different subject. We could go on there, but listen, I appreciate you coming on because you've got a really wide perspective, and I think it's it's fun to kind of take these different disciplines, connect them together, contrast them, kind of pull them apart. And uh, you've seen it and lived it. So I appreciate you coming on today. Hey, where's the best place? People can check out your books on Amazon, but your best website to send people to, where should we send them to? I have uh, I have a website called www.emmanuelderman.com, which has a lot of the stuff, not easily accessible, but it's all there. I want to clean it up. I have these two books, um, Models Behaving Badly, which is the later one, and um, My Life as a Quant, which are both available on Amazon or Barnes & Noble as ebooks or as hardcover. And I actually wrote a lot of, you know, I actually have, if somebody's interested, I wrote a lot of columns for for the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung at one point for about a year and a half related to some of these things, and I've got them all in an ebook together with some short stories called them um, bad behavior <laughs> on Amazon. And it's got a lot of general sort of short articles about this kind of stuff. Well, yeah, absolutely. People can go grab your books and dig a little bit deeper on some of your life experiences. We can only touch on so much in 45 minutes. And it's our first time talking. So sometimes if you get some slightly crazy guy calling you from Asia, peppering you with questions, you got to kind of stop and pause for a second and say, where do I want to take this? Yeah, I understand the feeling. No, I enjoyed this. I, I didn't know much about it before, but it was very interesting. Hey, Emmanuel. Thanks again, and uh, hopefully maybe we can catch up again in the near future. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.